Coming up next, we have a special message from Catherine Wood, Chief Investment Officer and CEO at ARK Investment Management. Also speaking will be Mr. Darius Fu, Head of Intermediary Business Development at Nico Asset Management. He's currently managing a team that oversees several key relationships in the Asian region, providing them with product solutions, training, sales, and marketing support. His topic today is disruptive innovation. Why now? Darius, please. Right, a very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you once again. And I understand that I'm pretty much the last solo uh, presenter before we end the day with another Q&A session. And I think um, Dejin has done a very uh, you know, wonderful job framing up what the internet, what this entire e-commerce you know, scenario is. And yet we dwell to yet a, you know, kind of like a sub-sleeve of what is called disruptive innovation. So I'm going to take us through in the next 20 minutes what disruptive innovation is all about, why we should be investing in this during this period of time. So before I get started into the content proper, I just like to introduce the people behind the fund and behind the strategy. And that is obviously us at Nico Asset Management. Um, if you're not aware of who we are, we are one of the largest asset management companies from Japan. And you can see on this slide, you know, our AUM is about $249.4 billion. So it's to say that we are quite a reputable and obviously sizable fund house. Now, the other more important aspect as you look on those numbers is that we manage you know, a multitude of different asset classes. So we're not just packed into an Asian specialist or you know, a global specialist, but we really have you know, investment people who can do a multitude of asset classes and churn out good products for everyone. And I'm sure uh, in the midst of all of you, you are, there are investors who have bought into our unit trust products as well as our ETFs before. Now, very importantly, who are the people that we partner to bring this product to you? And that is really the team from the ARK Invest company. So the ARK Invest team um, was founded in 2014 by Catherine Woods. And I know that many of you here today, uh, especially in my industry, there are a lot of friends who have been messaging me and say, hey, wow, you guys got Catherine to be able to come and present. So I want to just manage expectations off the, you know, off the fly and says she's not here physically with us in the studio, but she has recorded a message specially for you know, this particular purpose in which we will share it you know, somewhere down the line in my presentation. So stay tuned for that. But really, if you know Catherine and her team, then you know, they basically need no introduction. They are the experts in terms of looking and understanding you know, the technologies that is being created and worked upon today as we speak about disruptive innovation. Now, I understand that you know, during this period, there are two key groups of investors that are watching today. The first group who are very aware of disruptive innovation and the second group who could be a little bit newer to this. So to the first group who are aware of disruptive innovation, who have perhaps even supported us through 2018 to 2019 in the fund and all the way to 2020, we want to say a very big thank you. But do bear with me as I explain a little bit to those who might be new to the strategy about what disruptive innovation really is about. So just to lead us through you know, why this product or why this strategy will fit into your portfolios. The first thing to understand, obviously, is that as we emerge from a world devastated by so many other things of the past, you know, we essentially feel that you need to innovate in order to grow. Now, if companies don't innovate, if companies don't uh, learn you know, to make better use of technology, then you know, what happens is they will be uh, stagnant and they will fall behind. So obviously, when I say innovation is key to growth, this makes sense for every single company out there. Now, no fund manager will stand down here and say, you know, rest on your laurels, don't do anything, because that is only applicable if you invest in a perhaps, you know, distressed asset kind of a fund. But everyone understands innovation is key. But how do we then define what truly innovation is with respect to this strategy. So I want to just paint a little bit of history for you first and foremost. Now, while technology is something that has been ongoing for many, many years, I want to draw your attention to the last 200 years of history, as you can see from the charts. And in the last 200 years, I need to take you back almost you know, uh, to the time of the steam engine. 
right? During that period, the steam engine was perhaps one of the most noticeable, you know, innovation platforms of that period. And what that does is that gave rise to this thing called, you know, railway trains. And because of the railway trains, you then, you know, have uh, the next innovation, which is called the combustion engine, which then gives rise to the cars, so on and so forth that we know today. But in this chart, what is most important that I like to draw your attention to is the fact that when you look at the last 200 years, there has never been a time where there has been more than three innovation platforms converging at the same time. And that will be when you see electricity, automobiles, you know, and even telephones, for example. It is only during the last 20 years you start to see the computers, the internet, and the rest of the things starting to stack up, that you see a huge convergence of technological platforms taking place at one point in time. So if you are asking that question, why invest in technology today? The reality is this. It is not because in the past it was not viable, but it's really because today is when you see that many technological platforms. The opportunities today were not available three years ago, five years ago, so to speak. So with that in mind, I'd like to just draw on two more very important terms to understand our strategy before I shed a little bit more light on what goes on in terms of performance and what goes on in terms of the portfolio. And the first thing that I need us to understand is this word called disruptive. Now, when I say something is disruptive, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in the Singaporean context of things, I know most of us are thinking of our you know, past examples of Grab, of Uber, perhaps, right? When they came into the marketplace and they disrupted this huge giant called Comfort Delgro. But make no mistake, as I am about to showcase to you, when we use the term disruptive, it is not about companies who just come in very quickly to capture market share. When we talk about disruptive, one thing needs to take place. And if you're looking at this slide right now, I'd like to draw your attention to the extreme left-hand side. And you will see the title called Cost Curve Decline. So for any technology to truly become disruptive, the first thing that needs to happen is the usage of that particular tech needs to come down in the sense of the cost. So across these three slides, what I'm going to be elaborating on is electricity. So when electricity was first founded, electricity was very expensive to generate. And as you can see, that's why the cost curve went up. But then it came upon a time where people realized, hey, I can burn coal, I can burn natural gas, I can use hydro dams, so on and so forth. Then the cost of producing electricity suddenly fell dramatically. And when the cost of electricity fell dramatically, that's when it truly becomes disruptive because different other industries start to use electricity, which is what we call in the center chart, the cross-sector ramifications. So you start to see the automobile industry using electricity, right? The other manufacturing, FMB, so on and so forth. But more importantly, with technology, it doesn't stand still. So sometime about 40, 50 years ago, then came the invention that we know today known as the battery. People were not only able to produce electricity, pass it through cables and wires, but they were able to store it into little, you know, things called batteries. And from there, companies also innovated. They changed the raw material of batteries to become rechargeable batteries. And even in today's context, there's even more R&D that's going into it, such that you have uh, rechargeable batteries, lithium-ion batteries that can power everything from an e-scooter all the way to an electric vehicle. So that's very important that I want to put in your mindsets first and foremost. When we say disruptive, it is not just you know, a company that comes in, take huge market share, because somebody else is going to be able to come in, do the same thing that you're doing at a fraction of the cost, and then, in a way, you lose the market share. But that is not what we term in this particular strategy as disruptive. So I hope that gives you a good idea of what we mean by disruptive, which leads me to the second term that I really want to define, what is called an innovation platform. Now, a lot of times people will be talking about innovation from the perspective that, oh, this company is coming out with a new product, so on and so forth. But to us, an innovation platform is on the left hand, uh, right hand side, you can see things like artificial intelligence, energy storage, Robotics, DNA sequencing, blockchain technology. These are technologies today that don't just work for their own particular field. Now, when I come to this slide, two things typically happen you know, in my other presentations. I will get clients who ask me, hey Darius, 
How about solar? Isn't solar an innovation? How about quantum computing? How about virtual reality? Now, all these things are really innovative at the same time. But remember my first definition, which is disruptive. If virtual reality is so cheap today, ladies and gentlemen, I won't be presenting across to you via a video screen. Today, I will be a holographic image standing in your living room having this conversation with you. But the fact is, while those technologies are innovative, they are by no means cheap, hence not disruptive. In this point of time in history, these five things are what we consider disruptive because their cost has come down tremendously. Now, that's to say, with a strategy like ours, in time to come, when cost comes down for solar, when cost comes down for things like you know, virtual reality, we will be able to add them into the portfolio for you. But that being said, you're not buying into five specific sectors because there are a lot of companies that use these different you know, technological platforms and produce their goods and services. So famously, a Tesla, for example, will be someone that we would consider a play on energy, a play on artificial intelligence, and a play on robotics. And that's why you see on the left-hand side of this chart, you know, these 13 to 14 other subsectors, starting from things like adaptive robotics, 3D printing. They are interplays that are derived because of the five innovation platforms. So ladies and gentlemen, I know um, and I promise you that, you know, Catherine is going to come on at this point in time. Some of you who have been invested in the fund already, I'm very sure the fund has done well for you and you want to know what's up next. So I'm going to pause here for a moment before I come back to round off and hand this time now to Catherine who's on video. It's a recorded video while she shares to you what has taken place in 2020 and what she expects to come. Greetings. My name is Kathy Wood. I am CEO and CIO of ARC Invest. We have been saying for a very long time that five innovation platforms that involve 14 technologies uh, are ready for prime time. The coronavirus crisis has turbocharged all of them. They are in prime time. Uh, and that is why they're taking off at a much faster rate than even, even we expected. Um, and we've been trying to communicate uh, the opportunity uh, and, and many people have received that well, um, which is great. But then uh, as we're talking to investors, um, we, we have been a bit frustrated that we haven't been able to communicate to those who really feel like the broad-based benchmarks are where they uh, are, the, are the safest place for them to gain exposure to the stock market broadly. And so we put out, in order to illustrate that that is not true, that the, the broad-based benchmarks are not a good place uh, uh, these days because of all of this innovation, we put out a, a report called Bad Ideas. It's on our site. And we talked about all of the fixed assets that are effectively becoming stranded assets, whether we're talking retail or banking or energy or anything auto related, even uh, auto insurance. Uh, we think that uh, a lot of sectors are in harm's way and those sectors make up more than a third of the S&P 500 which is uh, the, the benchmark that many people use as, as their gauge. So 35% is, uh, is a big risk and will lead to, we believe, uh, subpar returns. Uh, so uh, I, I'd ask any of you who are wondering about the fixed assets that are going to be stranded and why they're going to be stranded and why book values are going to be written down, Exxon, last Friday wrote down, I think it was somewhere between 20 and $30 billion, which is about, uh, just for perspective, about 20% of its uh, equity market cap, which is, which is crazy, uh, but, but it's true. Uh, and that's because innovation is just blasting through the traditional world order. Now, more on innovation uh, during this post-COVID crisis environment. Uh, some interesting convergences are taking place. We know we've gone remote to work. We know we're enjoying uh, digital entertainment. 
Uh, we know we are uh, going to the doctors uh, through virtual visits, but something else is happening. There's a convergence among all of these digital services. We're seeing a convergence between entertainment and gaming. So social gaming, streaming gaming, we're seeing social commerce. So combination of online retail and a social experience like group buying or influencers helping us figure out what to buy and why. Uh, and social media is uh, developing new dimensions with virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, so we believe that we are moving into a digital third place, the metaverse. So there's always a, a question of valuation when we're talking about innovation. And it is true, the PE ratios of innovative companies are very high today, but there's an important reason why. Many of them are investing aggressively now because these exponential growth opportunities are in very early days. And many of them are winner take most. In other words, the companies with the highest quality data uh, and the most data and the best artificial intelligence expertise are going to uh, run away with some of these markets, be the dominant players. Now, many people compare today to the tech and telecom bubble. It couldn't be more different. In the tech and telecom bubble, the seeds for all of the innovation taking place now were planted. Uh, but they were planted and they were going to take 15 to 20 years to gestate. So here we are 15 to 20 years later, and these technologies are ready for prime time. Uh, so we are not going to have to value stocks using number of potential eyeballs, which is what investors did and speculators did in the tech and telecom bubble. Today, we are looking five years out and we're saying, where is this exponential growth going to take this network, this platform, this technology? And if the growth is exponential, we are willing to pay a lot today for companies to sacrifice short-term profits in order to capitalize on some of the biggest investment opportunities of our lifetimes. So we at ARC and at Nico Asset Management, our partner, uh, we are ready and waiting to help you stay on the right side of innovation, the right side of change, and uh, to a very exciting new world order. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back. I hope that with the sharing that you have heard from Catherine, that gives you know, those existing investors some kind of comfort, some kind of color in terms of what she has been doing with the portfolio in 2020 and with regards to how she's positioning it for 2021 as well. All right, so just coming up to the last six minutes of my presentation, I want to do a couple of things. So in adding this fund into your current model portfolio or your you know, existing range of products, what is it really that Nico AF is hoping to do for you as an investor? We hope to do three things. And the first thing is this, we hope to be a genuine source of growth. And in a short while, you know, while you heard Catherine talking about how well you know, certain companies or sectors have been for us, you're going to see our fund performance. And I hope that you will see that this is really something that you can add in for a good you know, alpha kicker within your portfolio itself. You're going to see the second thing, which is true portfolio diversifications. 
Many times I hear investors, you know, when they hear about the fund name, Disruptive Innovation Fund, and they go like, oh, I know, you're going to ask me to buy Apple, Amazon, Google, so on and so forth. And I'm going to surprise you by showing you in a short while, the portfolio actually doesn't have all these big tech kind of a names. So we've achieved the performance that we've gotten, you know, really on the back of a well-diversified portfolio. And I have to say, hand to heart, many of the names when I first joined Nico Asset Management, I didn't even know of them. I had to go and do some research before I understood what these companies were doing within the portfolio. And last but not least, obviously, if you're adding something like that into your existing fixed income mix, or if you're already a multi-asset investor, or even if you are a global equity investor, by putting this together and getting the actual portfolio diversification that you need, you're going to get a much better risk-reward kind of a profile. So let me go into the meat of what I'm talking about. As you can see on this slide, we've done exceptionally well from a performance basis. On the last three months, we've done 18% on the USD share class and 16% on the Sing dollar share class. And on a one-year basis, you see that we have managed to perform a whopping 117% on the USD share class and 112% on the Singapore dollar share class. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not a rounding error. That's not a decimal point mistake. That's literally $10,000. If you put it in the fund, it is now $20,000 and more. And in fact, uh, we're so thankful to uh, you know, uh, FSM1 especially because over this entire 2020, our fund has constantly been up there in terms of one of the best performing funds in the universe. But that is all fine and dandy and you know, compliance is going to compel me to say that past performance is not indicative of future performance. So how then, you know, most of you will be typing furiously right now. If the fund has done 100%, how is it going to do for 2021? Which leads me to the next slide um, to showcase to you what is actually in the fund that will help you to get better returns. Now, if you had heard Catherine just now as well, and in the future, while she's conducting her more recent um, you know, interviews as well as commentaries, she's going to tell you that this 100 over percent in 2020 was an exceptional one-off. Right? It is unlikely that we're going to repeat 100% in 2021. But that being said, how are we giving you, you know, the growth that you need? Well, I'm going to come to that as I round off this slide. But what am I trying to showcase to you here? So firstly, if you look at the left-hand side of the charts, right, on the left-hand side, you will see the top 10 holdings. And on the top 10 holdings, as promised, there is no Alibaba, there is no Apple, there is no Google. We're achieving it off the backs of very, very unique companies. And as you would have heard earlier on, you know, COVID-19 has done exceptionally well for us, really because a lot of companies have expanded their use of technology and have gone on to do, you know, uh, capture market share and do really, really well. So one good example that I want to point out to you, for example, is Teladoc at number six. Teladoc is an online pharmaceutical company. In the US, when you see a doctor, he gives you a prescription. You go to the pharmacy, you buy medicine from there, and then you go home. Now, in the past, in the US, before COVID-19, uh, online purchases of medicine was only about 10% user rate. Because of COVID-19, because of the pandemic, you know, closures, etc., you know, that user rate has gone up to 40 over percent. And now, with this 40 over percent of people who have bought, you know, medicine online, get it shipped door to door without the need to even get out of their house, it is arguable that they will continue to use this methodology. And as you heard from Turgeon earlier on, this is not just a US phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon where people's changing consumption habits will benefit you know, these tech companies over a period of time. So I hope that you know, just by looking at the top 10 holdings, you get that comfort that we're truly asking you to buy into companies and names that you are not existingly owning in a multitude of other products. Now, on the other spectrum, on the right-hand side, you will see as well that while the name is Disruptive Innovation, it will surprise many people that our largest holding is actually not tech. At this point in time, the most innovative sector is actually healthcare. Now, of course, that's followed very closely with tech because we've got e-commerce, you know, online storage, etc., etc., right? And all these are weighing very heavily. But the benefit of this product as well is this. The day will come where finance could be the next most innovative, you know, sectors or consumer discretionaries. And what this means is that we have the ability to switch 
Now, if you are invested in certain funds that are only limited to one kind of technology or one kind of exposure, they have no bandwidth to switch around when the opportunities come about. This fund is going to be evergreen. When the next opportunity comes about, you will see us start to buy into it in a very big way. Last but not least, as you are studying and learning more about our funds, we are not you know, really focused on things like healthcare as a tech and all that. The center portion, which is what we talk about most often in our commentaries, things like cloud computing. And that's really because our analysts are all grouped into the specific technologies that they are researching and or have studied along the way. So we're not getting a bunch of analysts who are in their 40s, in their 50s, with 20 years of experience. Our team of analysts under Catherine literally have an average age of about 32 to 33 years old. And many of them, they have actually worked in all these pharma companies or in all these tech companies before they join us on board as fund managers. So the key difference is they really, really know the technology very well. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that while I am you know, opening a whole can of worms and there's going to be a multitude of questions that's coming in, I want to just round off this slide by giving you one last assurance. Catherine has always been asked also, what is the prospect given that you have done 100%, you know, that your fund is going to continue to do well in the next one year? And the reality is this, while we are looking for growth, she always summarized to say that we're looking for growth by finding companies that can double their share price in the next three to five years. So realistically speaking, we're asking for all these companies not to do 100% or 700%, but we're asking them to return 15% year on year. And after three to five years, they would have achieved that doubling effect. So I hope this also gives you that comfort that if you're looking at the Disruptive Innovation Fund for 2021, the realistic expectation is for us to do about 10 to 15% you know, returns for you. And you can speak to you know, the guys at FSM1 for more advice in terms of how that fits into your overall portfolio allocation. So in closing, I just want to end off um, with this uh, last few words. Some of us, we look at 2021 as a year of uncertainty. We don't know what's to hold, right? Looks empty. But I hope that after the sharing, you guys will have some ideas that you feel are worthwhile to explore and add into your portfolio. Now, sometimes when we're looking at stocks and shares and you do it once and you think to yourself, ah, that's, that's, that's just coincidence. Can't be. I just, you know, if I am permitted to use a Singapore slang, hang, hang on here, buy the right thing. But you know what? I'm very sure that as you do a little bit more homework, as you attend the next few days together with SSM1, you are able to find out that there are more opportunities that you can encounter. And last but not least, first time lucky, second time a coincidence. I hope that once you've started this journey, not just with ourselves, Nico Asset Management, but with our partners, FSM1, you realize this is something that becomes repeatable time and time again. I hope you're giving me a round of applause over there at your homes. I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, I would like to hand the time back to the MC Geraldine. Thank you.